I am joined today by a very special guest, Joe Foster. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. It's an absolute honour to have you spare your time today. To the general population, the name Joe Foster might not ring an immediate bell unless you're vastly into British fashion or British entrepreneurship. For the listeners, who is Joe today in 2021 and what might you be known for? Well, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, at my age, uh, I get the odd uh, cough that I need to clear up. Um, no, it's great. I mean, it's uh, a long time since uh, my brother and myself started Reebok. And, uh, and I guess we didn't really start Reebok to be known as Joe Foster or Jeff Foster. I, I think our, our aim was to become Reebok. That was the one. That was, that was the plan. Um, and we didn't, we didn't see, even in those early days, have a plan about that. It was just that uh, we needed to change. And I don't know if you've read the book, but mo- most of this, there, there we go. Right here, Joe. <laughs> <clears throat> most of these podcasts and people wanting to know more has come from writing the book. And uh, a lot of people do say, well, why, did, you know, why didn't you write it earlier? Why did you write a book? And somehow it didn't seem right earlier. It was time to just rest, relax, listen to people, do things, watch Reebok grow or do whatever Reebok was doing. But um, so many things, you know, technology's advanced everything. And uh, as such, everybody knows everything about everything. However, when you're somebody like me who's experienced something and you're reading that everything and you find out, no, that didn't happen. No, Mm -hmm. it it didn't happen like that. Sorry, no. So you get to the point where you think, "Mm, about time to uh, get this straight. If I tell my story, then people can refer to that. If if they want to refer, how did Reebok start? Um, It didn't start because Jeff and myself changed the name of the original Foster family company. It changed because... We, uh, when we were growing up, you don't know any different. You grow up with a family and that's it. But we did two years of national service, way, way back. I'm talking about 1953 to 1955. <clears throat> and when we came back to the family business that we'd been working in for a short while, and we looked at it and we found this business is still in the 1930s. Jeff had been in Germany. He'd seen Adidas, he'd seen Puma, he'd seen how they were growing, changing, and as when we came back. So we came back to a company, and now that company had been started by my grandfather. So we're now going back again, and we're going back to 1895. And in 1895, um, my grandfather, same name as me, Joe, he made himself a purse spike running shoes. And uh, why did he make that? Well, he, he, he... he was a member of the local athletics club. I think in those days it was called Bolton Primrose Harriers. I don't know why it was Primrose. I, probably after the pub they went into. <clears throat> but uh, he, uh, he decided he made himself a parish. And why did he decide that? Well, his grandfather, and he used to go visit his grandfather, used, was a cobbler. And as a cobbler, he used to repair shoes. <clears throat> and repair shoes. And not only did he repair street shoes, he also repaired cricket boots. Now, in those days, and we're talking about uh, 1885 to 1890, they had spikes in the bottom. And they, probably my grandfather said to his grandfather, why have they got spikes in? Obvious answer, to give them grip. Grip when they're bowling, grip when they're batting or fielding. So it's pretty obvious grandfather then had a bit of a light bulb moment and thought, well, we run on a cinder track and we run on grass. But we were slipping about all the time. If I made spikes, well. <clears throat> so grandfather was quite an, an average runner. He would come sort of halfway down uh, the pack in a race. But when he made his shoes, his first race after that, he came a very unlikely second, which um, got a lot of attention. And that attention, he wasn't a big lad. So it could well have been that they sort of looked at him and said, hey, Joe, you've got to make us some shoes. Or they, they asked him, Joe, would you? But <clears throat> I think he was probably bullied a bit into that one. However, <laughs> he started making shoes. <clears throat> started making shoes for the local athletes. And uh, 
that's where his business started. And the wonderful thing is that uh, today we hear of influencers. In those days, he knew about influencing because by 1904, he'd set his own business up by 1900. By 1904, there were three world records broken in his shoes by uh, Alf Shrub. <clears throat> in, in a one hour race, Alf Shrub uh, broke three world records. But he got those because Joe had obviously seen this, this is a top man, give him a pair of shoes. Brilliant. So <clears throat> he knew. And at that, after your grand, grandpa uh, founded the business, your dad and your uncle Bill inherited it, right? And that's the company that you ended up working for. It is indeed, yes. But to get to that point, we, we're, we're talking now 1904, first decade of the 20th century. Second decade, we had World War I. By we came to the 1920s, this was my grandfather, Joe Foster's, really his bad epoch. This was it. During the 1920s, he, he, he more or less made everybody's shoes for the Olympics. And I, I don't know if you've heard of Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire is a film. Well, it's a film little. about three, three, that's it, Eric Little. Uh, I think he was a Scotsman, wasn't he, Eric Little? Yes, he, he um, was, he was. Harold Abraham and Lord Burley. Uh, they all won gold medals during the 20s. But their shoes, they were made by Joe Foster, my grandfather, along with many others. And um, we, we do have um, a letterhead from the 1920s where grandfather lists down all the clubs that he was supplying. And you can hardly name a football club in the country, even Rangers, Celtic. He was supplying them with boots and training shoes. Way back, uh, and it has on the top of this one, so supplies to all athletes for the Antwerp Olympic Games in 1920. So he, he obviously knew how to, uh, how to grow his business and he knew what influenced it. In those days though, his influence would be to influence athletes. Now, influence are used now, but they, they're influencing street. Now it's gone yeah. from just athletes into to an athlete, it's gone to street. So during the 1920s, that was my grandfather's belly pot. That's brilliant. However, he died in 1933, which was 18 months before I was born. And I was born on his birthday. Wow. <laughs> so grandmother, she was a bit of a firebrand. And she said he's brought his name with him. My mother didn't like the idea that I'd be called Joe in those days, no. But she had no choice. She had no choice at all. <clears throat> Grand grandmother had last words, so I became Joe Foster as well. 1935. Of course, by 1939, we had World War II. And as you suggested, by that time, he had died. And my father and Uncle Bill, they took over the business. Well, in a way, they took over the business. They really didn't take over the business until 1939 and even beyond that because grandma, grandma took over the business and she kept them together. She made them work. Um, but unfortunately, uh, when she died, I think that was seemed to be the end of the relationship between my father and uncle. For whatever reason, I still don't know today why they were just so embittered towards each other. But of course, we do know that Adi Dassler and Rudy Dassler both the same, <clears throat> couldn't work with each other. And so Rudy left and Rudy set up Puma. And of course, Adi Dassler was Adi Dass. Uh, didn't happen in the Foster family. So J.W. Foster and Sons got stuck where my grandfather really had died and after that where my grandmother had died. And they were making this same shoe. So Jeff and I, we went into, both same time went into forces. Jeff had been deferred. I went in when I was 18. And we came out, I was 20, young men, and we tried our best to get father and uncle. Look, you've got to improve this business. You know, we need to do what we did. I think the word marketing didn't exist in uh, sort of the, uh, the, the mid 50s. It was all to do with sales. We, we have to have salesmen. We have to have a plan. You know, we've, we've got to get this business growing. However, by 1958, We'd given up on the idea that they would ever get together or we would ever improve on, on the Foster's business. Jeff and I had uh, gone to college at night and we'd learned, we'd learned about shoemaking. Okay, we knew how to make spike track shoes 
from the 1930s. But we needed to modernize. We needed to be in today's market at that time. And so the best thing about it, whilst we did learn a lot more about shoemaking, we also made friends. We made acquaintances. We got to know people. We got to know the business. And that was tremendous help because when we did leave in 1958, we needed people to, where do we get machine from? So all these questions, we could get answered. And we moved down the road six miles and set up our new factory, which was uh, in an old brewery. It was called Mercury Sports Footwear. And why Mercury Sports Footwear? Well, that was the name I came up with. Seemed very good. Mercury. And we also had the Wing Messenger as our logo. He was on the, he was on the side of the shoe. Um, brilliant. 18 months later, it, we do it quite nicely, we're making a bit of money. <clears throat> we're selling our shoes, and that's quite good. And the accountant said, you're doing okay, but what you need to do, you need to register your name. And, of course, I, you know, what, what do you mean? You're 20 to register your name, why? Well, if somebody else decides they're going to make sports footwear and they want to call it uh, Mercury, you can't stop them. You're going to have to go to court. You're going to have to prove that it's your name. So, but if you register it, they can't use it. Oh, right. Fair enough. How do we do that? Well, you go and see a patent agent and in Manchester, not far away from where we were. Patent agents, fine. I called up, uh, called up the guy, um, Wilson Dunn and Ellis was the company. And they said, look, okay, Mercury, we'll look for that. A few days later, he came back and said, uh, sorry, it's taken by uh, I think it was British Shoe Corporation, a registered this name. Uh, you can have it if you want, but you have to buy it for a thousand pounds. Well, to us in those days, a thousand pounds was impossible. Absolutely impossible. And I'd, I'd gone along to see him. And uh, so the, uh, the patent agent said, look, he pointed through his window. It was nice, nice warm air, like May or June. And he pointed through the window and to a sign, Kodak. <laughs> and I get it. So what's Kodak? He said, exactly, it's nothing. It's a made up <laughs> name. Yeah, if, if you want a name, make it up. Because so many names which everybody knows are registered in some way or the other. So he said, okay, don't bring me one name though. Give, give me 10 names to, and we'll put those to the, uh, to the registrar. <clears throat> okay. So I go back, I sit down with the table with Jeff and we're sitting around and we're going, bringing up names like Cougar, Falcon, you know, names which are sort of a bit of aggro in there and a bit of, well, yeah, that's good. So we had these 10 names, but in 1943, right in the middle of the war, I won a race, World War II. I won this 60 yard sprint <clears throat> and my prize. My prize was a dictionary. Yep. A dictionary, yes. But it was a Webster's Dictionary. I didn't know at the time what a Webster's Dictionary was. <clears throat> Not so many years later. But it's an American Dictionary. Which means quite a lot of the spellings in the dictionary are different than they would be in the Oxford English Dictionary. But uh, how would this dictionary? So we're looking for names and I pick up my dictionary. I like that letter R. I thought, ah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So I flip through to R ah, and start just going through. Luckily, E is not far down once you start with R. Ah, I soon get to E and I come across R W E B O K. R W E B O K. What is it? It's a small South African gazelle. Gazelle. Wow. You know, we're a running company with sports gazelle. That sounds fantastic. Okay, Reebok. I put this at the top of my list and I go back to the, uh, <clears throat> to the guy in Manchester. And I say, look, here's your 10 names that you want me to, but we need this one, Reebok. And I said, okay, right. I said, we've got to be in love with that name. You know, this is our business. It's got to, you know, it's, it's emotional. We, we've got to have it. You know, we've got to believe in it. You know, just picking a name and any old name wouldn't work. However, he put it to the registrar, and it's the only one that came through clear. 
All the others had some sort of little problems with them. Okay, we could probably have gone through some of the problems, but this one came clear. Reebok. However, the registrar came <clears throat> and said, yes, you can have Reebok, but it's got to be in part B of the register. What do you mean part B of the register? He said, well, if somebody wants to make shoes out of Reebok skin, we can't stop them. Well, you know, okay, fair enough. Because <laughs> <clears throat> 20 years later, he came back and said, we moved Reebok from the B section to the A section. Because now everybody knows that Reebok is a sports shoe. It's no longer an animal. Wow. I remember you said in your book that um, you've had a series of luck in your life and one of the lucky moments is registering the brand internationally at that stage. Was it with Derek Waller, I believe, uh, you, you, re you registered it, or with his assistance, and that later saved some um, uh, information, uh, sorry, uh, some copyright uh, problems 20 or 30 years later? Oh. <clears throat> Derek, yes. Derek was another stroke of luck, quite an unusual man, um, a very serious man. And uh, he had worked for Pilkington's and he had done the float gas agreements all around the world because Pilkington's invented <clears throat> float gas, glass that we know today. But they, they invented how to do that. So we did the float gas around the world, which was useful for me because uh, although I didn't know it at the time, we would require to... Uh, to sort of register Reebok and to have agreements for distribution around the world. <clears throat> but uh, yes, on, on this occasion, um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what had happened is that registering the name costs a lot of money. Um, and one didn't realize how much money it would cost. And we registered, I think we registered for UK, Europe, Japan, and the USA. And unfortunately, we, as I said, we couldn't afford to buy Mercury name. <clears throat> really, we couldn't afford to register Reebok. <clears throat> but that's when, of course, the bills came through from uh, Wilson, Good and, uh, and Ellis. And, okay, you know, they sent them through and I put them off and said, look, you know, would you accept some post-dated checks or, uh, you know, can we, can we go another, give us 60 days? <clears throat> and unfortunately, and, I, and I, I still to this day don't know really why, why they did what they did, but they, they decided to bring us into a, a winding up order. They, they set a winding up order against the company. And uh, I received a piece of paper and, okay, what's a winding up order? I don't know. So I go across the road to our accountant and say, look, Peter, uh, this winding up, what does it mean? And he said, well, what it means, you have to fight it and fight it very quickly. Otherwise, you'll just be out of business. And this is where Derek Waller came in. Because he, he'd been to a, a, a different court case. Um, Peter and Derek Waller had been defending. And Peter said, you need to see this guy. Because we, we went on a case and we had three aces. And he got a draw. He said, I don't know how this man managed to get a draw to that because we, we were absolutely going to win the case. He said, so go and see him because he obviously knows this stuff. And I did. And Derek was a very unusual man. You could ask him a question and he would just sit there. He, almost for a minute, he would just sit there. <clears throat> you could see something churning over, but you'd be sort of thinking. <laughs> and then he'd say, okay. And that was about it. Okay. <clears throat> he wouldn't tell you why or anything. Okay. And he would then take the case and, and he, uh, he, got, he got it thrown out. He got that thrown out. So we, we lived, we survived that particular one. Uh, <clears throat> and after that, he did become a good friend and we, we did do uh, distribution agreements uh, all around the world. But yes, Derek Weller did, uh, did keep us alive on that occasion. Um, so we become we become Reebok. Excuse me. <clears throat> but of course, apart from challenging our, our name, we've only been about four years into the business. 
when we got a letter, a letter from Adidas. Adidas, oh. And the fact is that we had two stripes and a T-bar on the side of our shoes. That was our silhouette. And of course, Adidas have three stripes. And Adidas considered that our two stripes and a T-bar infringed the three stripes. Well, <clears throat> not, not only were we sort of, well, what do you do about that? But we were delighted. I did this. I thought, we, we'd got them writing letters to us. What is this? Yeah, they recognized us. Fantastic. So as with the name, it was much easier to think, oh, can we change our silhouette? And that's what you've got on your T-shirt now. That was the silhouette we, we changed to. So we changed to the arrow with the down stripe. <clears throat> By, and, you know, again, was that luck? Was it meant to be that uh, they would write and say, no, that, you can't have that? So we changed, and we changed to something which is certainly more, uh, you say, visible. More, you know, it defines Reebok now. That's, now that, that is Reebok's uh, uh, silhouette and signature, if you will. So... <clears throat> Apart from the many problems that, that we were to face, it was a question of, right, we're doing well, we're in the running business. And I used, yeah, I had to take my own medicine and that is I told my father and uncle, we need somebody on the road, we need to go selling. So I thought, okay, I will go selling. I'd had one or two uh, agents, they'd done quite okay for us, but uh, I decided I would go on the road. And I went and I'm calling on retailers. And some retailers knew us, some retailers are buying Reebok, but a lot weren't. And I present myself and said, Reebok. And you know, the guy would look at me and say, who? Reebok. Oh, who's that? They no, no idea. Um, so I had to explain, Reebok, running shoes. You know, we come from this, from 1900s, Fosters and whatever. And you know, we're, we're the new Reebok company. And uh, he would look, quite a few of them would just say, I've got Adidas and I've got Dunlop. Why do I need Reebok? Good question. Why did he need Reebok? He didn't. He wasn't missing Reebok. So why did he need it? And that, that was a bit of alarm bells from me. I don't know, he doesn't need Reebok. I've got to find my customer. And my customer was the athlete. And... Uh, we used to go around to uh, events, running events, and we'd sell shoes out of the back of the car. And uh, <clears throat> that was okay. But then it struck me that these are my customers. These are the people I need to sell to. And again, maybe a stroke of luck or not, but the athletics, we had the three A's, the Amateur Athletic Association, and they brought out a handbook. And in that handbook with two, 300 names, of the secretaries of every club in the country, names and address. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Letters, I just wrote letters. Everybody got a letter and offering them 15% discount if they wanted to buy our shoes. And if uh, they could either put that 15% to club funds or the secretary could keep it, or you could find an agent in the club, somebody who'd like to act on our behalf and they could have the 15%. I got. 150, almost 200 agents. Brilliant. We started to expand. Our shoes were selling. Fantastic. But then, okay, we can only grow so far. And uh, to me, I knew America was the big market for athletics. Every college, every university had coach. And coach was God. You could, you could go to university with a, an athletic scholarship. So I, I knew that that was a bigger market. In fact, Foster's were, were actually selling into, uh, into America in the 1940s, late 40s. Was that, the Frank, Ryan? was that the Frank Ryan deal that Frank you speak Ryan. about in the book? Uh, That's um, right. But Frank Ryan. The polarity between yeah. your uncle and uh, your dad, they didn't accept that offer, didn't they? But you, you tried to re reinvent it uh, within your, your Reebok career, right? Well, we tried to because uh, what they were doing with Foster's, they were taking the shoes again from the 1930s, the hand sewn turn shoe, which is a very nice shoe. Uh, it was brilliant, but of course, it, 
cost too much to make. It was a very expensive shoe. We, you needed to uh, have, have a shoe which would be right for the market uh, and also the volume because hand-sewn shoes, you, I, I think one person could do about, I should say, three or four pairs a day. That's it. Hand-sewing the shoe together. So when we left, we didn't do any hand-sewing. We were straight into machine operations and whatever. And uh, yes, Foster's have been selling about 200 pairs a month to Yale University. And Yale, they were distributing in, in America. And I had met Frank Ryan and when he came over, we used to come over to Ireland. We, obviously, Irish descent, so we would come over to Ireland. And uh, uh, I went to Ireland and we spent uh, two or three days with him. In fact, he tried to get us to move our company to Ireland. Um, and a lot of questions were asked, uh, but we never moved. We, we didn't do that. Joe, Joe, I remember at this point, uh... Did Frank Ryan turn up in a Cadillac and you live quite like a luxurious two or three days? Was that your first taste of what um, successful entrepreneurship might look like? <laughs> I, think, I think the biggest thing about the Cadillac was that uh, he, he obviously was quite well off. I think his family had invented the ticket. So <laughs> as such, they, they were obviously making a lot of money on royalties in America. And he used to come across with his wife um, every summer to stay in just outside Dublin, Dunleary, I think it is. And he used to bring his Cadillac as well. Well, I mean, when I went to him, he picked us up from the airport and drove us downtown in this Cadillac. The thing is that uh, it was made for America. You know what I mean? And I think they call it New York parking. Because when there wasn't enough space for him to park the car, he would just come in and push the car up, then you'd reverse and push the other one backwards <laughs> just to make space for this monster. And it was, just, it was a, uh, a sports car, so the, the, lid, the roof came down. So it was only two doors. I mean, and the doors were so wide that you open the door and it would totally take the pavement. So everybody had to stop. Nobody could come past once, once this door was open. It's massive, absolutely massive. And uh, yes, I, I do remember it was a, you, know, you think it was so out of place, you know, in these sort of winding roads in, uh, in Ireland, just outside Dublin, and you know, it bounced about. And, and he, he rented this sort of almost like a, a mansion. And we drove up to the gates and he got out and he said, Joe, do you want to drive it up the, uh, <laughs> up the drive? Oh, right, why not? <laughs> so that was it. <clears throat> I had the pleasure of driving this up the drive to, to the mansion. He wouldn't let me drive it through the, the streets of Ireland, but yeah, up there. Yeah, it was great. But, you know, the American cars are so like, it's like driving on sponges, you know, so bouncy. The, <laughs> so that was quite incredible. Yeah, I, I enjoyed doing that. And, uh, but nothing came of our, I think our time with Frank. Uh, I think he was probably a bit too old to start another business with Reebok. Uh, what he'd done, he'd done with his friend, Bob G and Jack. They were both coaches at Yale. Uh, I think Frank Ryan, I think, was the mild champion at one point in his life of uh, America. So uh, quite a good connection. But I mean, what he does, it comes back to the fact that I knew America was really where we should be. And in 1968, took to 1968, got this, uh, I'm looking through a magazine, and the British government are saying, um, you know, we'd like, we'd like you in the sports industry to export. And there's the NSGA show, which is the National Sporting Goods of America. That goes on in Chicago, the 7th, I think it was 7th of February, Chicago. And uh, <clears throat> if you want to go, we'll pay for your return airfares. Uh, we'll, we'll pay for your stand. We'll provide you with a stand there at the NSGA show. And we'll... Uh, We'll pay half of your hotel and your, your expenses whilst you're over there. Great. Couldn't really refuse that. Going to do that. So uh, I had a chat with a friend of mine, Bob Brigham. Brigham, it's Alice Brigham Sports. So they're, they're, they're actually an outdoor company. They're still doing very well. Actually. They've quite a few stores around. And so Bob, Bob Brigham, who was the, was the older was of the two. Bob, was Bob the creator of the, did he create the, the hill walking shoes? That you partnered with was that Bob's brand? Yes, Bob wanted us to uh, do his FEB, 
I mean, the company was called F. Ellis Brigham, you know, Fred, Frederick Ellis Brigham. So it was F-E, F-E-B Brigham. It's now just called Ellis Brigham's, the, uh, the company. And, and Bob wants this lightweight rock climbing boot. There was, um, uh, there was one in France. I think it was, what was it called? E-B. It was a, a boot made in France, but it, it was quite expensive. And whilst it was good, you know, Bob wanted one that uh, we could probably get the price down a bit and one that he could put his own name on. So we were making for Bob <clears throat> this FEB uh, rock climbing boot. And uh, Bob was happy enough to come along with me and do the uh, NSGA show. Uh, and we sold some of his boots at the shop. But, oh, well. <clears throat> you know, we didn't sell any of my, uh, my shoes. And you know they were well accepted. The guys come along and say, "Wow, I love your shoes, great stuff." Where do I get them from? And I say, "England, <laughs> uh, England is that New England? No, no, it's England. It's across the water." Oh, yeah. And that was the one thing that put them off. The, the, the thought of importing just didn't work for the sports stores. I mean, surprisingly enough, Bob sold some of his boots. So the out, I think the the outdoor companies are the outdoor shops. They were used to importing skis, ski boots from Europe. They were used to that. So to import a, a boot, uh, a rock climbing boot, I don't think was a big problem. But the sports stores, no, they, they were not used to importing. So they couldn't import. And this is 1968. Does, does this lead on to the, the, uh, the opportunity with Lauren Sports? Is this where Lauren Sports were, were introduced to your story? Lawrence Sports were there before because with Lawrence Sports, <clears throat> a friend of mine, he was he was the sales, he was uh, Ed Sales, sales manager there, really, really good salesman. <clears throat> and we talked, and Lawrence Sports only made boots. They made football boots and rugby boots. Um, so their season, you know, they would sell in August, end of July, or they would sell all their boots in. They would have a reselling time somewhere around Christmas then they wouldn't really sell much until again the next August. All they made was, was boots. But we were making training shoes, running shoes. We, you know, we were making a, a different uh, sports shoe to them. Um, so he said, why don't, why don't we take over your sales? And that to me sounded great. Why not? It would save me the problem of having to do the selling. Um, and I could then concentrate on export. On expanding the business, and I, and I could look, I could look at uh, America. So that's when Lawrence Sports came in, and uh-huh. so Lawrence, Lawrence were then doing our distribution uh, all through the UK. They, they could also <clears throat> distribute it abroad, but uh, they didn't really get into that. And, and it, we were only two years down that agreement when, as you've read the book, a series of events. Uh, Harold Lawrence, who was the head of the business, he decided he was retiring. He was in his 70s. He was retiring, <clears throat> and his son-in-law came in. And his son-in-law knew nothing about the business, nothing, and uh, made a disastrous uh, decision that they would change from the traditional way of uh, sticking and sewing the sole onto the boot and, and go for this absolutely new method of injection molding. All, all, all football boots are injection molded now. And that was definitely the way to go. <clears throat> the trouble is, he just threw out all the machinery that used to put the soles on, and they built this nice little area <clears throat> for this new machine to come in. Two things. One, it didn't arrive in time. By the, <clears throat> by the time it arrived, it was getting too late for the season. And the second thing is they built the building too small. So when they put, they couldn't get around the machine. <clears throat> so what they had to do is they had to increase the size of the building. By this time, they had lost all the sales. So whilst they sold all the product, they had no product to sell because they couldn't put the sole onto the shoe. <clears throat> and they'd thrown away all their own machinery. So... They went out of business. And unfortunately, they were selling our shoes as well, which meant that uh, not, since they couldn't supply the, the football boots, people were not buying the running shoes and the training shoes. And uh, 
you could see that the business were going out. And yeah, I, I had to uh, I had to hire a van and quickly go down to Northampton, collect all the shoes and bring them back. And that, that was it's quite an adventure, really, because they were owing us a lot of money, thousands of pounds in those days. I mean, it may have been only five thousand pounds, but it was a lot of money in those days. And if our bank manager had found out we'd suddenly lost all our sales, we would be in trouble. Mr. Stoppard, you probably uh, read that bit. Oh. So it was a question of what do we do? So we brought all these shoes back to the, the factory. And then everybody, we advertised locally. We went all to schools and we were selling to schools directly, anything to sell the shoes. And, and it worked. So many people selling all over the place. Brilliant. We were selling these shoes. And we were getting more money for the shoes than we were getting from Loris. So <laughs> No way. <laughs> yeah. So brilliant. All of a sudden, we were cash rich. All of a sudden, the cash was coming in. Fantastic. So we got over that as a problem. And it, it, was, it was a bit later, maybe 12 months later, that I found another distributor, Carter Pocock. Because Carter Pocock had been seeing how good we were doing. And, of course, they saw that uh, Lawrence had gone out of business. We want needed another distributor in the UK. And so they just became our UK distributor. And, and it gave me the time then to spend uh, on looking abroad. And as I say, um, we, probably during the 60s, uh, after I'd first been to America, but as, as I was again saying, it was 1979 before we actually got a distributor in America. And, you know, what had been happening? Well, the other bit of luck that had been happening is that late in the 60s, um, Bob Anderson set up his magazine, Runner's World. And it was just one single sheet. But running was starting to grow. People were going out, put, put training shoes on, and going running. And then along came 5K events, 10K events, half marathons. So running was started to really, in the 70s, it absolutely exploded as a category in, in America. So this was going, and of course, who came along then? Nike. This was brilliant for Nike, because this is what they were into running. So between Runner's World and Nike, the running market absolutely grew tremendously. And it grew that much that uh, Bob Anderson, his magazine started in a single page, became a nice, glossy, big magazine. And of course, well, he started to think he could, he could tell everybody what was a good shoe. So they started to rate running shoes. And they, they, had a, they had some devices that they would put running shoes through to make sure they, they were good for supination and uh, what cushioning, heel strength, all these different things that they decided. And it was during the mid, uh, mid to late 70s that he was saying, this is the number one shoe. Well, that was brilliant for, I think it was Nike. But yeah, Nike came number one shoe in August. It took them until after December to get the production, the, the demand created. Because you had a million runners, at least a million people in America, all of a sudden wanted the number one shoe. You, couldn't, you can't produce that. You can't get the production up to find those shoes in that time. So by the time they got production running and retailers had got the stores, it was almost ready when, for the next, uh, next edition and the next number one shoe. So the retailers were absolutely wild. You know, they, they were getting, first of all, they couldn't get the stock. Then when they got it, they were being left with stock. But they knew once the new number one came in, that was it. So Bob Anderson changed from rating shoes as number one, two, three, four to a star rating. Top of it would be five stars. If you had a five star shoe, right. And that meant you could have three, four shoes rated five stars. That was my opportunity. What we needed was a five star shoe. That would be the hook that would get somebody in America. The Americans would see that we, we had a product. It would then mean that we'd probably get a distributor. <clears throat> so I designed Aztec. Aztec, you may know Aztec, you may not know Aztec. Yeah, but Aztec was our, was our shoe. <clears throat> and we designed this for, to begin with, for the, uh, well, it, it was to get a five-star shoe, but we tested it out at the Commonwealth Games in Edmonton. 
And we, <clears throat> we actually made a, a gold range, Aztec, um, <clears throat> Midas was a racing shoe, and Inca. Inca was a track spike. So we had the gold range tested out in Edmonton, and we, we got a lot of gold medals. Brilliant. So by the time of February 1979 came along, I had the shoes, and we had them on display in the NSGA show. And we got a lot of interest. Amongst, amongst the interest was Kmart. Kmart were big wholesalers in America. And uh, the guy said, well, we'll, we'll take 25,000 pounds. Oh, right. Hmm. Right. We knew if we got a five-star shoe, we knew that we would need help. <clears throat> because 25,000 pairs of shoes would take our factory, our small factory, six months to make that. We, we couldn't take six months to make it. So we got Barter. Again, the man who'd worked, Shaq, who'd been at Lawrence, he moved to Barter. And Barter had just set up a, a sports division. <clears throat> so they, they would help us. They would make the shoes for us. Right, good. But then um, came out and said, but we need a better price. Oh, well, again, we knew that making shoes in the UK, <clears throat> we couldn't make them at the price. You could make them in Korea or Japan. So we'd already been talking to people in South Korea. So we said, yeah, well, if we get a five star, we know, we know what to do. We know where to go and we can do it. Fine. And also along came Paul Fireman. <clears throat> Paul Feynman, he, his brother, and his brother-in-law, they, they were running a small uh, wholesalers in Boston called Boston Camping. They were doing, obviously, tents, all your camping gear, um, fishing rods, you know, all the bits and pieces for the outdoor market. <clears throat> okay, that's the outdoor market as against the sports market that we were in. But Paul, he said, well, you know, I'd love to be a distributor. I think he was a bit fed up with just working with his brother and his brother-in-law. And they just did the same thing year after year. And he was a bit sort of, uh, well, yeah, I'd love to be your distributor. Okay. What do you think he saw in Reebok at that moment? Pardon? What do you think Paul Fireman saw in Reebok that you wanted to partner with you at yeah. that moment? Well, I don't know that he particularly saw something exactly in Reebok. What he did see is that the running market was really growing. <clears throat> you know, that was the business in in. It, it, it was expanding that rapidly, really expanding. And, it, and he saw that he needed to change rather than keep on selling in the outdoor market. Yeah, he, he loved the idea of uh, picking up a shoe that they could, they could run with in this expanding market. That would be brilliant. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so Paul said, but the only thing is, of course, right, you're advertising in Runner's World, but really what we need is a five-star shoe. Come, come on, Paul. This is, this is it. Look, this is Aztec. Okay, we're only in February. Shoe ratings don't come out till uh, August. This is going to be a five-star shoe. Ah, okay. <clears throat> Are you sure? I said, well, I'm as sure as I can be that this will get five stars. He said, well, if we get five stars, I'm in. Okay, Paul. So there's a bit of time between February and August, and I'd been... I think I've been backwards and forwards to the States to, to meet up with Kmart and uh, Paul again. Before, I think it was the last week in July when the August edition came out for the uh, for Runner's World. And I got on the phone, it was about midday when I got on the phone to Paul, which is 7 a.m. in Boston. So Paul was a bit sort of still just getting out of bed. And I said, Paul, just nip down to the, uh, uh, to the local kiosk and get the uh, runner's world. It's, it's, it's out today, it must be. Right. It was an, an hour later. <clears throat> Paul phoned me back. Joe, Aztec, five stars. Ah, oh, brilliant. That was it. That was a moment then. Five stars, brilliant. He said, but not only did Aztec get five stars, Midas and Inca also got five stars in their own categories. Wow. So oh. we had three five-star shoes. That was the answer. <clears throat> and getting those five-star shoes, Paul was on board. So that was the start. And running, well, it was obvious. The difficult, we didn't get shoes until 
well, till the, two, six months to get the shoes onto the market. But once we got on there, we got the five stars and we were, we were really running. Joe, what did you see in Paul Fireman at that moment in time, considering he was in camping in an, out, in, in outdoor goods? You <clears throat> must have seen some sort of traits where you thought he had the potential to, to grow or distribute Reebok for you. What stood out for you? Well, as far as I was concerned, what stood out for me is somebody who was willing to do this. He had a business. Uh, I'd had at least six failed attempts between 1968 and 1979. <clears throat> I'd had all these different people trying, doing the best. But we didn't have the hook. We didn't have that five-star shoe. That's something where there would be a demand. Yeah, it's hard to sell a product cold. You're saying, look, this is a good product. Yeah, but you need something else. And that, that was the five-star hook where people already saw, well, we already have a winning shoe. This must be a good shoe. So <clears throat> that meant that people wanted to buy the shoe. And that's, that's the difference. And that's why Paul wanted a five-star shoe. He knew that just selling a shoe would be difficult. Particularly in those days when uh, with runners world around, <clears throat> with Nike, New Balance, Satonic, Sacconi, <clears throat> there was no lack of shoes on the market. There were plenty of shoes around there. <clears throat> but a five-star shoe, well, you know, that, were, that would be the attraction. So it wasn't particularly with Paul, although Paul did have a business, which is good, because if, if you've got a business, at least you know, you, you've got the entry into the market, you know, you know how to sell and word sell. However, Boston Camping, of course, was the outdoor business, not the sports business. And uh, that didn't worry me. But when I, when I next went across after Paul had said, yes, I'm doing it, he'd already closed down Boston Camping. <laughs> they closed it completely. <clears throat> and I thought, well, I thought he was a bit sort of tired of this business. But I thought they would just bolt it on and it would become an extra. No. His brother went to make uh, wallets you know, with, with Velcro, so they snap wallets, I think, at that time. And we're talking about now the 1970s, just about, there was crazy these snap wallets. Were good. His, his brother-in-law opened a second-hand car lot, Terry. Terry went to do a second-hand car lot, and Paul was on his own. He would do rebound, which is a bit of a shock. He, re he remortgaged his house too, didn't he? Did that Did he show commitment? He, re he remortgaged his house at that point too, didn't he? Um, around about that point. Not at the early point. At the early point, he didn't need to. But um, the problem is with success. Success means your business is growing. For a growing business, you need money. You need money. Um, with um, In the early days when Barter started to produce the product for us, Barter gave a credit line. So Paul could get the shoes, start selling them, before he needed to pay. Um, when Barter, of course, the product was, you read the book, the product did let us down a bit, plus they were the wrong price. So, but Paul managed to get 20,000 pairs, and because they were bad, and they weren't all that bad. We knew there were problems with collapsing. We knew there were problems that changed the design slightly, but Paul didn't pay for them. He said, no, you can have them back, but I'm not paying for them. Well, Barter didn't want them back. And I said, well, if Barter, if you get them back, you've just got to destroy them because you can't, you can't sell them. They've got our name on them. So Paul was left with the shoes, and he was still selling the shoes. So where he had a problem, where somebody complained, or where somebody had a problem with the shoe, he would just replace it, which meant at that point he could survive and he could make some money because he wasn't paying for anything. But when you go to the Far East, when you go to South Korea, you have to put up a letter of credit which means you have to have the money or your bank is happy to lend you the money. But the South Korean people don't take any chances on giving you the product and hoping you'll pay. So that doesn't happen. So that's when you need money. And that's when you need to give the bank security. <laughs> and that would be Paul Fireman's house in, in the early days. Um, but it started to expand faster than that. It was really expanding. Um, and of course the next expansion because running was doing brilliant but there was this guy Arnold Martinez Arnold Cuban by origin lived in LA 
And uh, he's a tech rep because he was a good runner himself. He had, he had, he had visions of possibly doing the Olympics as an American. Um, but his wife, Frankie, was coming back with her girlfriends full of, it, full of this aerobics. This aerobics. What's this aerobics? And I was talking to Frankie. And Frankie said, well, it's great. We're exercising to music. Right? And it's that good? Yeah. It's brilliant. So Arnold said, I'm coming down to your next uh, class and I have a look. That he did. Went down to the next class. The instructor, she, she's wearing training shoes. Racing, running shoes or training shoes. And the uh, half the class were the same shoe. The other half, no shoes at all. Uh, now that was another lucky light bulb moment. This was time for Arnold. Arnold thought, why don't we make them a special, lovely, soft, glove leather shoe, cushioned, just like a running shoe. Why aren't we doing that especially? Great. Off he went up to Paul Feynman in Boston. And <laughs> this great idea, wonderful. What are you doing down there in LA? And Paul said, come on, we're doing great with running. Absolutely great. Why do we want to start playing around with another shoe for a few girls doing some dancing down there in LA? No, no, no. But Arnold wasn't put off though. Arnold was fairly convinced this was going to be big. So off he went round to the back door and uh, he met up with the production people. He said, look guys, just 200 pairs. Get me 200 pairs of this shoe. Glove leather upper, uh, nice and soft, made for a woman's foot, which meant it was quite narrow because the American woman's foot is quite narrow compared to most other around the world. We had to change that later. Okay, they did that. They gave him these 200 pairs of shoes and he gave them to instructors and I suppose that's the end of the story because it just took off like wildfire. Being down in LA, the girls just loved it. Okay, those first shoes were not good. They were made from glove leather and glove leather was far too thin to work on it and make it work as a shoe. We cured that in about three months. Had it been in the UK or many other countries, we would have been in some serious trouble because they wouldn't have gone out and bought another shoe. But down there in LA, they didn't care. So it lasted three, four weeks or whatever. We'll go and buy another pair of shoes. And they did. So that was a great thing. And then you've got Jane Fonda using them in her uh, videos. But Joe, it was more than just uh, a suitable aerobic shoe. It was you. You embarked on a, a female empowerment trend. The shoe represented female empowerment at the time, didn't it? Or at least aerobics uh, represented female empowerment. It was a, a trend that really set up Reebok pretty well. Absolutely. I mean, the the thing was that everybody knew Nike in America. Everybody knew Adidas. But the only the running fraternity that knew the new Reebok. And so when this shoe appeared down there in LA and they saw this nice white shoe with Reebok on the side and the Union Jack, beautiful little bit of color there. Wow. All of a sudden Reebok became a woman's shoe. We're not we're not Nike, we're not Adidas, we're not male, we're not sweaty. This was for women. And that is a big attraction. And I did just Nike and all the others just sat back and said, it's, it's just a fad, it's a phase, it's just something, it'll be gone in no time. However, that next year, we grew from a $9 million company to a $30 million company, $90 million, $300 million, $900 million. That, in successive years, was the growth of Reebok. Absolutely incredible. And by that time, we, we were becoming global. Because <clears throat> what had happened in America, suddenly everybody wanted it. And so that was a tremendous growth. And Okay, two problems there. How do you supply that amount of product, that growth? How do you supply it? Where do you get that product from? Luckily, again, we got this bit of luck. Nike, Nike had just hit the wall. They just got to a point where they were losing business and they had to shut down at least two factories in South Korea. Great. 
just right for Reebok. Reebok could take that production. If it hadn't have been there, we'd have been starving our factory, starving our business because we couldn't have made the shoes. Then how do you pay for that? You know, I mean, that's a problem. Not as big as the not as big as how do you get them, but how do you pay for it? Fortunately, um, we were in contact. Steve, uh, Paul was in contact with uh, Stephen Rubin. Stephen Rubin, Asco, Pentland. Um, his Asco business, Stephen Rubin Asco business, was actually sourcing product. That's what he did. He sourced it for all the British shoe corporation out of the Far East, and he wanted Paul to do that same in America. So that's how Paul became connected. Because if Paul could go to all the big seers, all the big stores in America and do his own brands. That was, that was what Stephen was doing. And Stephen gave uh, Paul an open letter of credit. You know, buy what you want. I don't care. You know, do it. Paul just wouldn't sell to any of these other people. He wouldn't go around looking for shoes for Stephen. He was Reebok. And he stayed with Reebok. But the Reebok business just grew. And in no time at all, Paul was owing Stephen, $20 million. So Stephen was your financier at that point, but you had to give 55% of the Reebok stock to Ruben, right? How did you feel giving, or how did Paul and yourself feel about giving such a large stake away in the business when you had it to yourself for so long? Well, I, I think you've got to be aware of when you've, uh, when you've reached a point to step aside, or at least to allow others in. And if you don't do that, then I think your business will suffer. You've got to see, as I said, this wasn't about Jeff and Joe Foster, how good we can be. This was about Reebok. We needed Reebok. This was an opportunity for Reebok. And so you've got to look at it and make a decision. And you make that decision and, uh, yeah, people say, you know, do you regret certain decisions? And uh, all I can say is, by the time I left, which was the end of 1989, Reebok was number one. We'd overtaken Nike, we'd overtaken Adidas. And we were the number one sports brand globally. How can you regret that? <laughs> it worked. It worked. And by the end of 1989, we were so big. We were a four billion dollar business by then, and uh, for me, the excitement had stopped then. Now, now we're full of lawyers, uh, we're full of accountants, and, and we're full of people who are used to selling vast quantities and how to package them, how to sell them, how to do the buy-in. Wasn't my company at that time, so it was time for me to retire, stand back. But as I say, this is a bit like uh, the Eagles and Hotel California. <laughs> yeah, you can check out, but you can never leave. You can never leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that has been it for me because I've been being called back time and time again. Oh, John, what's this? What's this? And you know, how did this happen? So, uh, you know, my connection is, is still there. What year did you sell your shares to Paul Fireman? Did I sell to Paul Fireman? What, what, what year did you sell your stake in the business to Paul Fireman? I, I never sold to Paul Fireman. Oh, okay. I, I sold to Pentland. You sold to Pentland. Pentland. Okay, and that's, that's when you started yeah. to manage Reebok International and the rest of the world. I took over it. Yeah, I took over international, and we're talking about 84, 85. And then I, then I, the agreement was I would, the rest of the world was mine. And I just said, Paul, Paul, you look after America, because the bigger and better you can get in America, the easier it will be for me to do the rest of the world. And it was. And we had that agreement. Anytime anybody asked Paul, Paul, how can we get these in Poland or whatever, he'd just say, go see Joe. So, so it was, and I could take that on, uh, and the, it allowed the company to expand. And and I think that this happens to probably many companies. You've got to be careful how you expand your business because you've got to make sure you you stay with what makes it grow. You stay with the thing 
that, that, it re- that core business. And that core business was America. Uh, and it was great. The fact that Americans, they were just looking after America. They would look after Canada and Mexico as well because the, they were bordering countries. But the rest of the world, that was for me. So I was all over the world. For 10 years, I just traveled nonstop. I was going around the world probably about three, four times a year. I would go around the world just meeting, uh, either working with some people, bringing more people on. And I, I think I put on another 30 countries. So it was quite a busy time. Do you have a particular highlight uh, of your travels abroad? Do you have like one standout story? My travels abroad, well, I've got many of those. I mean, and, and if you read the book, of course, you've read my uh, Around the World in 80 Days or Less trip. That, that, I mean, that was a remarkable trip. And I met a lot of things and did a lot of things. And you know, to be in Los Angeles and you know, be invited to Ginger Rogers' old house. You probably don't even know Ginger Rogers, but uh, uh, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, in my day, they were, they were massive. And, uh, you know, to go and stand upon a studio or dance floor was, was incredible. To go through that house, uh, to look at the scene, you know, she had two big picture windows that you could overlook Los Angeles. And this mural painted on the wall were the visits that she loved to visit. And they were all down there in Los Angeles. It was painting the town red and it was all done in red. Fantastic. I mean, those are memories. And this is the one thing that, uh, if I do regret anything, is that people were not traveling with me. You know, on so many of the uh, trips, I was on my own. I had to make a decision. We didn't have computers. We didn't have mobile phones. I mean, the best thing I probably had was a calculator. And that was it. Otherwise, it would, in those early days, it was just a bunch of uh, American Express travelers' checks. That's the only way I could get around. Um, I mean, right, look, today now, technology is just oh, fantastic. What we are doing today now, We've done maybe 50 or 60 of these over the last three or four months. And yeah, you, you're, is it Glasgow you're in? I know you're uh, in Scotland. Ayrshire, Ayr- Ayr- but near Glasgow, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, but you know, that's not too far. We're in the middle of France. Okay, not too, but yesterday, you know, we're talking to America and I can be talking to Australia and we have the same clear picture, the same ability to get together and chat. Um, you know, these things didn't, didn't happen in those days. So it had to be, you know, travel. And if somebody could have been with me on many occasions, it was say, remember when we did this? And, you know, those were fantastic occasions. When you were in such a fast-paced role at the, at, at the time, did you spend much time just pausing and reflecting and absorbing all these memories? Or was it just on to the next challenge, the next country, the next city? Did you reflect much in the moment of, of what you had built and your, your role as a overseer of Reebok International? I don't think at the time I even considered it. I, I think it was a matter of um, there was always the next step waiting. There was, there was a queue of the next step. Which one is it? And so I think you get to the, to the end of the road without even thinking, what do we do? How do we do that? You know, we had some tremendous experiences. We, I think we took over, it wasn't Disneyland, what did we take over? Was it? Uh, MGM, MGM Studios. MGM Studios. A bit like Disney. We just, Disney. Yeah, it's at Disney. It's the MGM part. Yeah, MGM yeah. yeah. the MGM. We just took over the whole thing as a, as a company. As been, been working so hard, we took it over. So we had one evening with the whole thing to ourselves as a company. I mean, brilliant. All the rides, you could do what you want. You know, the whole thing. So <clears throat> you, you don't you don't consider how these things happen. They just happen, and you know they're incredible. But uh, you know this this is this is what happened during that journey, and this is why when it came to the end of nineteen eighty nine, okay, I could keep on doing things, but I'm really not part of the business. So, yeah, you know, I'm I am part, but I'm not. I'm not working on it. It's it's got that big. That yeah, you know, and it was time for me. Plenty of time. I needed to get out of the business in order to be able to look back and do that reflection. In fact, I can reflect now more than, than I could do it almost any other time, particularly since writing the book and getting people to come and, and talk and want to know what it's about. I can reflect more. I, I sometimes wonder, how did you manage to do that? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> when you and Jeff uh, set up Mercury Sports, when you closed your eyes and pictured a, a future version of Reebok or Mercury Sports, was it was the, the, the dream that you had in mind quite like what uh, the reality became? Did you think you would be once taking over MGM and flying to all these countries, or did you always think, did, did you think more nationally and small frame at that point? Well, you know, you have some romantic dreams, some ideas that you're going to grow and going to be big, but really I had no idea. You know, it, it was a matter of what's the next step? How can we do this next? You know, where are we going to? How are we growing? And, and it was really a... It was really trying to keep up with the business. And this is what happened in America. Uh, the demand for the aerobics, the aerobics demand grew so rapidly that it wasn't a matter of the company trying to f- figure out where to get the next sales, how to, how to develop the business. It was a matter of how do we keep up with this? Because I can remember sitting with Paul Feynman at one, one point when the business was really, really growing. And uh, Paul saying, Joe, I, I know how to stop this. He said, but if I do... I just don't know how to start it again. So, yeah, that, that was the dilemma of how, you know, trying to satisfy the growth of this business. And probably, probably Reebok grew too fast, if, if anything. You know, it was the fastest growing business ever at that time in America. Absolutely incredible. And maybe it grew too fast. Maybe it didn't give us time to grow enough depth in the company and think about it. Like I said, think about it. No, you're just going. But uh, it was an incredible ride, uh, and we enjoyed it tremendously. I love. It. I, I want to kind of unpick some of your kind of origin story uh, from when you were a child. What were you like as a child, though, Joe? Were you curious and a bit of a disruptor, or were you more placid and observant and quiet? What were you like? Well, I think in many ways I was quite quiet, but in many other ways also I was a little bit disruptive a little bit wanting to know a bit more and not willing to accept where we were, what we were doing all the time. But, you know, in my very young childhood, of course, it was during the war. It was six years during the war. And, uh, you you don't think there's anything different in life. That's how life always is for everybody because you you have no experience of anything else. Um, And you just grow up like a kid. But, you know, if if you're not just happy to, I could say obey all the time, but question sometimes, you know, why, why, why do this? And, and I guess I did question on a few times. I did question some things, some things uh, without a doubt. Uh, Jeff was more rather one to just get on with it and not worry. It was the same when, when, we, when we set up the company. <clears throat> he just wanted to work in the factory. He was just so happy doing that. He just wanted to do that, run the factory. He didn't want to do any marketing and his sales he, he didn't want to consider anything else he was just so happy in fact i did the design as well and he was just happy to produce that design make it into a product uh, and that was jeff's so so jeff was happy to do that and i, and I think in a way having seen the uh, problem between my father and uncle I, I think that was really good for us because it meant that uh, i could just get on and do it. We, we never had we never had a crossword you know, we, we sat down and we decided things and we did things. And Jeff would more often say, yeah, just get on with it. Do, you know, do as you will. He did come to America on, uh, <clears throat> he did it twice. Certainly did America once and we did LA at that time. I went up to see Bob Anderson in his place where he did run his world. So he did come across, but uh, <clears throat> not in those early days. In those early days, he was just happy for me to just get on with it, <laughs> which we did. Do you think the lack of a kind of emotional touch point with your father helped you uh, develop traits that would succeed a uh, Reebok? Um, for example, not having to satisfy uh, your, your dad's uh, ambition for you. For example, my story, I, I don't live to please my dad, but that allows me to go and do whatever I want to do. Do you think that helped you be disruptive and be more innovative because you've got no one else to please? Um. Well, I think, you know, I think when you're a youngster, I think you always like to please people. But I think if it's, that, if it's, if it's against your, um, if it's against what pleases you, I think you also have to be happy doing that. If, if it's doing things just for the sake of pleasing somebody else, no, you do become disruptive. You do 
turn away. I turned my back on running because for me, it didn't work. My father wanted me to be an athlete, a runner, but no, uh, I, preferred, I preferred to play a game, to a sport. You know, and eventually I played badminton at a reasonable level. Uh, you know, that, that was my sport. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's, it was probably, there was probably something in my grandfather that drove him to do what he did that he did something entirely different and he was, he was really good at it, which I don't think he passed on to his sons. In some way, I think he developed something. They were just happy to see what he'd done. And I don't think they, I don't think they were challenging enough to say, well, now we can take it on. Now we can improve on this because they didn't. And whether it was because they didn't uh, see eye to eye, they were not friends, I, I don't know, but, but something didn't get passed on because when I look at that, uh, that letterhead that we have from the 1920s and I see what grandfather did and how he supplied all these football teams, you know, I, I wonder in these days, why, why were we not number one in football? Why, how did we let Adidas in? You know, why, why were Foster's not good? The fact that he died in 1933, he was too young. But even when he was young, yeah, you would have thought, well, that must have given his sons an opportunity, young enough. Because during the three years that Jeff and I had come back from doing national service, trying to get my father and uncle to, to do something, uh, my father would say, look, when I'm gone and Bill's gone, this business will be yours. And I said, well, Dad, number one, we don't want you to go. That's not the objective, you know. The objective is to get you to go. But this business will be gone before you go. This is the problem. And, and I think had we stayed with it for some years, and had we stayed until probably another five, six years, I, I just don't know if we'd have had that spirit. Yeah, I was 23. Jeff was only 25. What could go wrong? You know, you just do these things. Yeah, how can anything happen? No doesn't matter you know we, you, you don't have a thought that you might fail there's no no such thoughts it's yeah we're setting up a business we're, we're going to succeed because we, we're young enough not to have that second thought not to have that nagging at the back end well what happens you know we haven't got too many responsibilities okay i just got married but you know that was it Did you, you know again even my wife was young so we were young and uh, and, and being young, we're just indestructible. You don't, you don't worry about it. When you get a bit older, I think you've got too many things. If you've got children and all the things that go with it, you have those responsibilities. You start to think too much. Joe, you label yourself as uh, a shoemaker. Your book's even titled Shoemaker. Um, do you think if you didn't inherit these skills through working for your father, do you think you would have... Uh, found similar success in another industry if you didn't grow up as a shoemaker? Um, I, I think, I mean, I had, I, I, my education was engineering and uh, I could have gone into the, um, um, to the aerospace business. That, that was certainly an opportunity for me when I was, uh, when I was younger. Um, I did national service and was invited to stay on with the Air Force and it was a bit of a temptation because there was a promise for a commission and probably to go on to fly in and maybe maybe flying fighters and things like that. But I decided against that because you can you see that's only a short term. It's something that well, yeah, you may do it for ten years, then what do you do after ten years? Whether I thought that deeply, I doubt. But it just didn't you know, I was trying to stay on that. <clears throat> I think had I been in another business, I think, yes, I would have done something. I don't think I would have been happy just going to business, going to work and doing a nine to five or an eight to five job, whatever it was. And that was my life. No, I think I was too inquisitive, too disruptive, if you will, too much in need to uh, do something for myself, even if I did it wrong. It didn't matter because... If you do it wrong and you realise that, you can put it right. 
Okay? You know, failure is not a problem. It's just the next step to being successful because you, you learn something from it. And I learned a lot on my, on my way through trying to get distribution in America. I learned an awful lot. And eventually we got there. But you, you, have to have, you have to have a brain which can think in front. You can think up, how can we do this? You're not always right. <laughs> but, you know, if you've got that sort of brain that wants to think rather than just wants to stand there and do things. You can, I, and I know it's very tempting. I, I get very tempted that if, I, if I've got a, a job to do, it's nice to just stand there and do the job. Just get on with something. It doesn't require any thinking. But then you get to the point where I couldn't do this all the time. I must change something. You know, this needs, you know, you need something different here. And, uh, you know, my wife now often says I should have been an architect because I love designing inside of properties and designing properties. I think we've had about four or five where we've just redesigned it totally. And, yeah, and I enjoy that. So I suppose there's always been a bit of a pleasure to look at something and look at something differently. Wow. I remember one of your first employees, employees was an apprentice. I'm an apprentice at KPMG, the firm I work for now. Do you think if you were to start Reebok again today, you would uh, be a, uh, an advocate of apprenticeships and do you think you would employ more apprentices? Well, I, I think you have to encourage uh, young people to do what you're doing and that is to think. Uh, and I think with an apprenticeship, that, that gives you some skills. You, you learn some skills. Um, but, I mean, the number of people who have probably left my employer because they want to do something else, I would always encourage that. You know, encourage people. But also, when, when you bring people into your company, it, it's good for them to share. People need to share that ownership, as it were. And if people um, do share the ownership, they do you know, have ideas that do work hard and they do, um, well, they, they add value to your company. So again, it's not just taking people on for nine to a five. Yeah. An apprenticeship, fine, you learn some things, but then, you know, you've got to be able to give to a company and you, you want those people. Employing people, it's better to employ people who come to you and say, can, can I do this or I'd like to do that, as against going saying, we need somebody to do this. Yeah, yeah. I was like, in fact, I did spend some time in an accountant's office and just ticking off. No, I could never be an accountant. That wasn't for me. You know, I couldn't just do that. I needed to do something which was um, more progressive and you know, something where, where you found a result. That's interesting, Joe. Do you believe in luck or do you think you create your own luck? It's a bit of both. You do create your own luck. I think you, 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 the biggest thing you have to begin to recognize is opportunity. Because so many people don't see an opportunity. And by the time they do, it's gone way in the distance. It's gone past. So I think you've got to be able to recognize opportunities. And, uh, and, and I guess there's a, a certain amount of luck that those opportunities arrive at the time that you can see it. That, you know, it's a bit of a two-way street. It's um, <clears throat> when, when we were growing during the 70s, this was the same time that running was growing. We happened to be in running and in, in sports. I, I mean, I can remember companies trying to get into it, big companies, companies like Clark's. Clark's wanted to get into the sports business and they made some sports shoes. But nobody ever, nobody ever looked at Clark's and thought, thought of them as sport. You know, they don't, you, you've got to look at something and you've got to see what that company is. And if you look at Clark's, yeah, you think more of street shoes, children's shoes. You know, that's where you see Clark's. So it's what your vision is with Reebok. This is why we were lucky when we were growing during that time, there were not too many of us. And we, we were not an offshoot of somebody making ordinary footwear, somebody making street footwear. You know, this wasn't just a side, this, this was us. We were. We were, we were the sports business. And when people looked at us, they saw us as an athletic shoe business. You know, they, they didn't see us. You can look at Barter, and possibly you don't know much about Barter, but Barter are the biggest footwear manufacturers worldwide, globally. You know, they, they're just incredibly big. 
Um, but they, they just make shoes. They just make street shoes. And so for them to go into football or anything else, they need, you know, they need it under another name. They did try under another name, but unfortunately, they're driven by a parent company, which is really a football company, not a sports company. We, we used to make shoes, athletic shoes, which put us into the business of making footwear. But our life, where we sold these shoes, wasn't on the street for people to walk in. This was in sport. You know, people were in the sport. So we were in two, two industries. We were manufacturing, but we were also in the sports industry. Yeah, and that's what drove our, our manufacturing. So we were always known as, as a sports company. And uh, it, there were so many. I mean, Coggins, were a lot of people, Sim, Simlam, a lot of people who sort of in, in my early days made sports footwear, but they were always somewhat associated to a company doing something else, you know, that made either heavy footwear for mining boots, yeah, army boots, stuff like that. And so it's what you, what you recognised as. We were always recognised in, in that sports way. That's interesting, Joe. I remember you said that you wanted to grow Reebok, not the brand of Joe Foster. And that's perhaps why the name Joe Foster might not come to mind when you ask the general public. Do you think in 2021 it's equally as important to build a personal brand as an entrepreneur as it is to build your own brand? Now that, now that we have social well, media and the likes. I think with social media now, you get that relationship a lot easier. You know, you know, you only need to look at the Americans and uh, Musk and Bezos and you, you relate to big industries that they have grown and then oh, who grew this. You know, and like I say, we, we've now got uh, social media to such an extent now that you do need a personality there. They do need to talk about people. Um, yeah, so it's totally different now. You know, to set up today, <clears throat> the first thing you have to look at is technology. It's... Uh, I, since writing the book, it's amazing how many people sort of come and ask questions and you, you, you talk to people. Um, even some of the old Reebok people have come out of the woodwork and you know, we're, we're talking again uh, about different things. So it, it's, it's quite surprising now what's, what's happened. We're not just writing that, but now we, we have this, we have computers, we have Zoom. You know, and this, this has moved forward 10 years. If we hadn't have had COVID, you know, we wouldn't have had Zoom to this extent, it, it, it's, it's moved it forward 10 years. And okay, everything's going to settle back down again in maybe six, 12 months time. We're going to go to a certain extent back, but this is here forever now. You know, this, this is how people will talk to each other. We've got used to it. Uh, you, you don't need to do what I did and that's jump on a plane uh, and fly five or 8,000 miles uh, to, to meet with people and then have to make that decision. If your role as head of uh, Reebok International and the rest of the world existed today, it would look much like this podcast on, on Zoom, which would perhaps stifle your, your passion for the job, but it would give you more time in terms of efficiency to do a, a, other pieces of business. How do you think the role would have looked if you were head of uh, Reebok International and the rest of the world right now in this digital environment? That's hard to say because uh, I'm now much older than you. I mean, it would look like you, a young man. <laughs> yeah, you have to be young to be an entrepreneur to do these things. Um, I can only reflect. So, yeah, and, and to probably take 70 years off me, uh, you know, you think mm, you, you'd just be a kid then of uh, 15 <laughs> yeah, and you're growing up in this world. I would know every button to press, wouldn't I? I would know everywhere to go. Yeah. Right now, when something happens, I have to shout, Julie, Julie, you know, look, I've lost this. I've, what's happened? Yeah, but if I was a kid of 15, I'd, you know, I'd be turning this inside out. It's, you'd know absolutely everything about all the technology. So today it is technology. And I, I don't, I don't very much people could go anywhere in this world and grow it without growing the technology. And like I said, I'm meeting a lot of people and there's at least two come up with technologies 
to ask me what to do. And okay, luckily I've been able to point them in a direction because I know some of you can help. People who have grown the technology in Reebok or people who were in Reebok who are now big in technology. So it's what you've learned that you're able to pass them on. But it's all, all to do with technology now. Everything is so incredible. And social media now, it, is, it just, it's our lives. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, if, if you were setting up something, I don't know, I mean, I said some of the, some new ideas which, are, which have been brought to me. And yes, I would probably be in that. If I was anything between 15 and 25, I'd be, I'd be up there and pushing to say, well, wow, yes. Where's it going to happen? Where's it going to go? Yeah, are we going to need uh, stadiums as we see them now? I mean, yes, you need people there, you may be, but yeah, with the uh, the technologies we have, photographically and cinematographically, yeah, you know, you know, people, you will be able to sit by, and be, you're almost on the pitch. I mean, I think one of the one of the sports which has really improved through all the cinematography and what we have today is something like cricket. Cricket is probably boring to most people. But today, they can slow that ball. They can do everything. You know, you're watching every little bit, and they make it interesting now. And, and there's a lot of sports where they do the same, but I think cricket has gained an awful lot through the fact that you can see every minute detail. And you, you're almost, you're on there. You're on the field. You're, you're almost playing. And you know, is that, are we all going to be three-dimensional? Is everything going to be, you know, everything turn up? And you know, instead of me talking to you here, you're going to be sitting in this chair next to me. Yeah, is this where we're going? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to be an image of you. It's, it's going to be three dimensional. We're going to be sitting in this chair. Mm-hmm. I, I would almost be able to touch you. <laughs> yeah. this, this, is, this is where we're going. <laughs> what young entrepreneurs inspire you today? What companies and brands do you look at now and and feel a little ounce of inspiration? Well, I mean, you've got, to, you've got to look at Elon Musk, whether you like him or you don't like him, but you know, that is incredible. And the stuff that Amazon are doing, you know, you, uh, you know we have Alexa, you know, and you wonder, well, since she hears everything you're saying, where's that going to? You know, have we now lost our privacy? You know, do we need to switch everything off? <laughs> because everything is being passed around, incredibly so. Um, so yeah, people like Elon Musk, and you know, the, the, there's lots of people out there who are who are running companies which are now relying upon uh, technology. You know, technology is taking taking over everything, and uh, and I think that yes, we are going electric. Yes, we are we are moving in in the directions that we need to move to have a better planet, to have many things, uh, but also there are plenty of dangers because it. We get the incitement that you've got in America. You know, these things bring over the po- many other possibilities. And uh, you know, not, not everybody likes to be nice. <laughs> Quite a few people don't like to be that nice. And they use it in the wrong way. So, but, you know, that's the pros and cons. Now that you've written Shoemaker and you're doing these podcasts and you're on Clubhouse... What's next for Joe Foster? Will you just relax at one point, Joe? Well, I've relaxed for quite some time, and uh, I, I think now I have quite a mission, and that mission is to get the book to become a bestseller. <laughs> I, I, not much point in writing a book, is it, unless no, people read it. You know, it, it, it might be it might be useful to be sort of uh, for yourself and say, "Well, I did that, yes." But now I'd like people to read it, and uh, I, I think we seem to be doing very well. You know, and uh, people do pass on the word. Listeners of the podcast, read Joe's book, buy it off Amazon and rate it five stars. Joe, I've rated it five stars. I loved hearing the the working class story of Joe Foster. If you could go back in time and give young Joe a piece of advice who are, who's currently working for their dad and Uncle Bill, what advice would you give them? Believe in yourself. I think if you have the energy, um, don't frustrate it. You'll only regret that if you just sit on it. Have a go. Just, and, you know, to be an entrepreneur, you need to be quite young. 
because you don't need to have the fears that you have as you grow older and the responsibilities. So just believe in yourself. Go ahead and keep going. It's not always that easy. But, you know, it, you, you, would, you would regret not trying. And, and I think uh, if you've got some belief, don't, don't ask too many people too many questions because you will get confused. Trust yourself. I, I love that, Joe. This podcast aims to exist, it, it exists to um, use people's origin stories, whether entrepreneurs, rappers, CEOs, uh, charitable individuals, as a means to motivate others just to start. And I think the last hour of our conversation will really do that. Where can people find you online now, Joe, if they want to reach out and connect? We're, we're, we're on all, uh, um, well, all the platforms. I think we're on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a big one. What was that there? Twitter. Twitter. Um, we're on them all. So you, you know, go on to Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Instagram. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. As, as we want the founder, we, we're on there. I'll make sure to promote it, Joe, and I'll promote your book too. Thanks for stopping by today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, like I said, it was the very first podcast guest that I... I approached and I'm so glad we could make this happen, Joe. It's a pleasure. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure for me too. And I hope it works for you. I hope you get a lot more out of this and just keep going at it. You know, it's <clears throat> make it a passion and enjoy it. Definitely, Joe. Thanks for stopping by.